Hello everyone, welcome back. Well, today, <laughs> come join me. Would you ever expect to see a naked woman attached to a church? That's because you haven't heard of a very old tradition of Sheila and a gig. An old tradition that is no longer fully understood. It got lost in translation somewhere between, somewhere in transition between the pagan times and the Middle Ages. So sit back and relax as I tell you all about it and don't blush. I'm here in Herefordshire in Kilpeck today um, and Kilpeck is really really famous for exactly this church. Um, now I'm here in winter so today as you can see it's really really cold um, but perhaps that provides some well-needed context to what I'm going to tell you about. So at a glance, Kilpeck Church might appear quite modest and, and you wouldn't really suspect that there's anything, um, well, untoward. <laughs> you, you might not suspect that there's anything extraordinary, but oh boy, there is. Really unimposing entrance, simple wooden gate and just a traditional Norman church. So why? Why might you ask? Well, so Kilpeck Church um, it's really old actually, so it was built in the 12th century, so early 12th century. The reason I say that is because we know that at least in 1130s, so in 1134 there was already a record of this church, so it's at least as old, but potentially was built even, even earlier. Now, before I show you the really extraordinary, we kind of need to talk about this church and, and sort of the context of it. Um, if I don't get eaten by the monsters. <laughs> so if someone said to you, what do you expect to see around in a church? You'll say, you know, maybe crosses, you'll describe the shape, uh, you know, beautiful windows. I'd speak of godly things, icons depicting Jesus, maybe um, the, Virgin, the Virgin Mary, um, some kind of godly um, expressions. But really that wasn't entirely the case in early churches. Um, so you've got to remember the churches were essentially converted from the old temples that would have stood. We know that there, that there was a temple, there was a pagan temple here. Um, and then they were converted over to early Christian churches and then later Christian churches. And then even later, in some cases, they were built and rebuilt. Um, the very first creations were in wooden. Um, so obviously those often burnt down or just, or just you know, didn't stand the, um, the test of, um, of the elements. Um, so, of course, the, the, you know, the people were still, the communities were still the same. You can't just rip it all apart and expect people to take over the, um, take on the new religion. Um, and because of that, what we see on the very old church is, is a lot of organic um, symbolism, a lot of creatures. So in, in, in the time, Sorry, the snow is crunching below my feet because it's, it's really, it's really snowy around. Um, so you see a lot of organic features. You see the beasts. Um, there's even a term for it. It's called bestiary. So essentially, you see this um, multitude of beasts that are intended to scare the the Christian into um, sort of into believing that you know they'll get punished if they don't behave. Um, but really, all that symbolism it comes from way, way back. Um, it's not really a Christian invention at all. It's a, it's a very pagan way um, of seeing things and certainly Viking as well, which we see a lot of that symbolism around here too. Some of them are really serpent-like, almost like Viking-like, you know, the way they protrude almost like if it was a ship, you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't even doubt, you'd say it's definitely a Viking one. So the historians will, of course, look at the um, just the entry um, and they will marvel at this. And, and I agree that this probably is one of the most amazing pieces, but this is not what I want to show you. I will talk you through this just, just so you have the context. Um, so what we have here, so essentially um, above the doorway, um, you have the Tree of Life. So that's very, um, again, it's a very popular symbol. Um, and then you've got all these beasts going round and some of it is quite grotesque so you've got um, you know you've got these beasts with human heads um, that one there has a, a very humanly 
head on a body what sort of looks like a lion. Um, there's heads spitting out tongues that are then then almost looking like further beasts. There's there's that head there um, with snakes coming out of it. Um, there's a very Celtic motif there with a sort of intertwined um, cords there. There's these dragons and these serpent heads. Um, you know, the, the, these beasts are sort of look at, like a, like a, almost like a canine face. Um, dragons. Um, you can see that there's there's a serpent there, or, or, or sort of like a dragon, um, trying to swallow its own tail. So that signifies the the circle of life, if you like, the eternity. So that's all really, really typical. And of course, the, the, this beautiful um, green man, we call it nowadays. Um, so again, this is big head um, with them. Um, floral botanic motifs. That's a bit of context. That's already quite unusual, isn't it? Um, but there's more. So now as we go around the church, so we've gone past the nave um, and the chancel, um, and now this is the, the sort of the, the end bit of the church. So this is the most holy bit, which is called the apse. Of course, we're on the outside of it, um, and this is where the fun begins. So if you look up above, essentially all all around just where the the roof meets the walls you've got all these mythical creatures all these um they're sort of like um grotesques i guess we would call them some of them are really celtic like that one um there's a ram there there's all sorts of creatures there's heads uh, almost like a mask which is a very pagan concept as well um there's these mythical beasts Again, some of it is a bit floral. This, this looks like a fish, this one. Um, and as we go around, there is something really, really incredible in this church. Right, right here. What do you think that is? <laughs> so, this is what's called Sheila Nagig. So Sheila Nagig is, is a grotesque of, um, of what looks a fairly, I would say, an old woman, if you look at the uh, sort of overall, the, the stylism. Um, but essentially, it's a female that's grabbing onto her, her vulva and exposing it. So yeah, as I said, don't blush, don't be shocked. Um, and this is not the only example of it. This is probably one of the best examples, um, just because it's so well preserved. Now, before you say, no, no, it can't be that, it's not that now, you, you misunderstood. Yes, it is that. It is 100% that. <laughs> you want to have a look at it again? So, Sheila Nagig, um, it, although it might seem quite surprising to you here today in the 21st century, and it certainly seemed surprising to the Victorian, um, well, visitors, shall we say, um, including the clergy. <laughs> um, Sheila Nagig um, was nothing surprising to the medieval people and certainly nothing surprising to the pagan people if we believe indeed that's where it comes from. I mean, it could technically, it, this could be a very um, sort of uh, early medieval, so a dark age um, tradition. But really, um, it's more likely to be, to, to be dating way, way back, sort of like a pagan idol, like a pagan goddess. There's a lot of these figures that go around. Obviously, there's only one Sheila on this building, on this church. Um, but there's, all, there's close to 100, some like 80 of these figures, if you count them all. So, um, so some people, and, and this is again, this is back to the, the, the Victorians. Um, of course, they, they try to explain it. Um, by the sort of the, the body lust. So you can see there, um, there's two people hugging and there's there's another sort of contorted person, I don't know, dancing. There, there's this um, this little chap playing what looks like a rebec, some kind of a medieval uh, musical instrument. Yeah, probably a rebec. Um, so, so of course they try to explain it. Well, you know, it's a lesson. It's sort of if you, if you dance and, and, and drink and, and, and play music too much then that could be um, a slippery path to sin. Now okay so that works for these figures here uh, but Sheila out out there you know she's she's set completely separately apart from from all these other uh, clusters of, of, of sins and and of course you know you, you could argue that all these figures they are kind of some of them are protective and some of them are 
the, the, those dark forces and, and this is normally how church symbolism works you've always got the struggle between the devil and the good um so in in these these early churches you always have this bestiary as i as i was mentioning earlier so you've got these beasts and they're attacking the small small person that is then seeking sanctuary in a church and, and for as long as you're in a church you are safe um, and of course then you have to be wary as you go to the outside world as you go about your daily um daily duties you need to be always on the guard because uh, because it's only church where you can feel truly safe. And I think that's a lot, that's a much more accurate description of, of Sheila and the gig. And, and the purpose of Sheila um, is really the protector. Um, the reason I'm saying that is because, okay, so we've got this one here. They are quite rare, but let's not forget that there are around 50 of them remaining just in, in, in England and Wales and Scotland. But when it comes to Ireland, there's there's a hundred there's I think there's over a hundred of them that remain just till to this day so can you imagine how many of them there would have been back in in middle ages um, they would have been everywhere there would have been hundreds um, if not thousands um, and the interesting thing is uh, although in the UK you mostly find them on churches in Ireland where essentially they're I don't know if they if, if they originate from there maybe they're just better preserved so it's really hard to tell um, but they are found everywhere. They are found on wells, they are found on castles, obviously they're found on churches, um, or just above doorways, um, so any, any sort of building of significance, anything that needs to be protected. So, you know, if this was a lesson, if this was some kind of a, a symbol of evil um, and a, a sort of a sin and, and, a, and a lesson to be learned, you would be placing that above doorways um, in, in, well, perhaps in houses, but you wouldn't be placing that on a well. A well is almost this, always this most sacred place that, 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 that provides you with water, that cleanses you. And you want to keep that place really, really pure, the most pure that you can, that you can keep it. So you certainly wouldn't put something dirty or, or ungodly um, on a well. Now, one very interesting thing about Sheila's is that they're, they're not really young women. They're not, they're not really sexualized. So they're normally displayed as these old, um, old women, sort of an old hag image almost. Um, and you, you'll never see the, the, them being beautiful. So they'll never have a, a sort of a attractive face and hair, um, you know, the sort of perhaps breasts. Uh, they're never portrayed that way with traditionally what we find attractive. Um, they're always portrayed mostly bald, um, with faces that are either sort of, you know, just very neutral and, and, and sort of quite old looking um, to downright scary and grotesque. Um, often they're displayed without breasts, or sort of really small breasts. Um, and really all you can see is, is just the vulva. So, so really it's all about that one particular body part um, and they're always holding their hands and sort of displaying it, um, sort of exposing themselves, almost like opening themselves and welcoming you in, um, which is really, really consistent with, um, with the pagan, you know, pagan goddesses. It was a very, um, very commonly accepted uh, belief that, you know, whether it's the mother nature or, or some kind of a goddess, sort of like a mother um, that, that, that protects you and feeds you and keeps you safe. And in that sense, the Sheila is actually really unusual. Um, now, that's why I wanted to tell you more about them before, before I pointed out this feature, is that she's actually smiling. <laughs> she's friendly. <laughs> she's the only Sheila that I have seen that is actually smiling. Now, the reason I think she's smiling um, is because if you look at the other sculptures, they all have these similar eyes and they all have these very well pronounced features, you know, whether that's mouths or noses. And that's why I think she's slightly different in the sense that she follows the style of other um, sort of, you know, other other, other creatures um, and she's got these same big eyes which which means she, she would have been created at a similar time like the all the other um, sculptures so she's not really a you know sort of like, like like an old pagan idol that would have been kept through um 
through years, although she does have, as well as the other sculptures, she does have um, sort of pierced eyes, which is a really pagan way of, um, of well, of carving really. So, so that's quite interesting as well. All these, all these carvings, all these sculptures, um, they belong to what's called Hereford School. So, um, you know, this, this was obviously a, a particular style in this area. Um, sort of fairly intricate, but at the same time, really, really primitive, especially when you look at the animals. Um, it's sort of slightly childlike. So if you look at the position um, where where the Sheila here is, is is based, so if you think you know this is the entrance, that's where you enter um, the church. Um, so really, the she oh sorry, I got it wrong. So <laughs> this is the entry, that's where you enter. It's because it's all behind me. And then as you go along, then you go and you go past this, this other door, and literally right there, there she is. So a fairly prominent position, as in you would have, um, th there she is, right there. Um, so in other words, you know, it's, it's at the front, so it's not really that hidden. Um, also, it's attached to the most sacred part of the church, as I've said, which is the apse. Um, so again, this is not in this case, this is not someone trying to hide it, like in some other churches. So there was definitely a movement at some point um, and, and, you know, eventually later a lot of Sheilas were destroyed, um, but there was also a move where, where people, whether they were, you know, craftsmen that were building churches, architects, um, or just people, just, just, you know, through, I don't know, bribes or, or whatever, you know, a lot of Sheilas were actually encased in walls and some of them are found still nowadays. They might be buried in the ground, um, they might be literally in, in, encased in the wall and hidden. Um, so that it still offers that protective feature, but obviously, um, you know, the modern clergy can't find it and therefore it cannot be destroyed, which has happened to, to this day is happening. Um, in fact, a church in Sussex had a, 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 what was thought to be a Sheila sort of really rubbed off um, that was um, recently destroyed by God knows who. And the reason I say it's really well preserved is not just because it's, you know, it hasn't been destroyed and it hasn't been smashed to pieces or hidden away somewhere. It's also because it's so high up, which means, ha, well, which means it hasn't been rubbed off. So what often what you see, and that's more where it's accessible, you know, so it might be just sort of next to a doorway somewhere or, or you know, um, somewhere on a well. Um, a lot of Sheila's you can see where they've been rubbed off. So people would place their hand um, on that sacred part um, and they would touch it. So, so again, that, that had a lot of significance. Um, perhaps people were coming for a blessing. Um, I don't know if, you know, if, if maybe young women would go um, to a Sheila asking for fertility or just people asking for protection and good luck. There's no Sheila inside, but shall we have a peek and see what's inside as well? Oh, it's absolutely freezing in here. So that's the font. This is where the holy water would have gone in. I think that's the original one because this one has carvings as well. Slightly less well preserved, um, but you can still see some some carvings. Where, and also it's been patched up over, over time. So whenever I go into a church, and this is maybe a tip for you if, if you ever if you're not sure what to look for. I always look at the chancel arch. So you see these dividing arches that would have divided essentially, well, the, the peasants from the holy men. Um, so back in the day in churches, so here obviously you see, um, back in the day people wouldn't have had anything to sit on. So it's quite likely they, they, they just would have sat on the floor. Maybe there would have been little stools, but it would have been really this part. Um, would have been really bare, so the nave it's called, and then and then the, the chancel arch separates the chancel from the nave. And in fact, back in the day, um, the the chancel where the arch is, there would have been a curtain or some kind of a cover. So actually, the common people wouldn't have been able to see what's inside the sort of the holy part of the church. Um, and here again, we can see a lot of carvings. 
around the chancel arch. So yeah, always have a look at the chancel arch and that will tell you a lot about the, the character of the church because that's what the, the, the common man would have, um, would have observed. Again, we see these big eyes. So again, it's all that, all the same craftsmanship, same sort of style. Um, they're not really smiling, these chaps, are they? <laughs> Unlike our Shiva. Yeah, so they're sort of slightly almost, um, I don't know, Asian looking to me, but um, rumor has it that this, you can see, if you've ever walked um, Camino de Santiago, so Santiago de Compostela, rumor has it that the church there has exact same sort of face. It's really, really similar style. So, so clearly, you know, if, if you can travel from Spain to, to England, um, clearly the craftsmanship was really highly regarded. Or perhaps some rich man sort of saw something, you know, commissioned a drawing and then brought it back home. Who knows? Again, some, some organic motifs there. Um, and a few more of these, um, these, these warriors, perhaps. Um, well, I say warriors. No, these are saints. Yeah, they've got books and halos on their heads. Um, and same, those one there. So, so now we... Um, we enter the chancel, um, and again, yet more carvings. Wow, so I really like, this is the Romanesque style, um, these churches, so they're really, they're really simple, they're sort of almost primitive, but I, I really like that. The reason we call them Romanesque is because they, they borrowed this um, Roman style of building, so really, really simple, but really structured, really sort of um, classical, and, and, and I find it really tasteful. Um, and really, really well constructed. Um, but essentially this is, um, so here in the apse, so again, this is the most holy part of the church, it would have been completely out of reach um, of the common man. Um, these carvings there, stone, stone carvings with also almost like serpents. And then they've got these heads at the top. Um, again, this, you know, you wouldn't expect to see that in a church. So it's really organic, really sort of um, almost like Viking style. And again, it's not surprising because this is a, after all, it's a Norman church. Um, and often, so often the apse would have been built sort of leaning to, to, to an old pagan temple. So often when you, when they dig down under the apses, they don't often do that because you don't just go and dig up churches, but whenever that's needed, whenever renovation happens, they often find either some kind of sacred stones, inscriptions below, just below the apse, um, or, or sometimes it's known that there was a pagan temple before that. So really all the churches, you know, the very old ones, um, they're mostly built on the foundations of ancient pagan temples. Now there is also this um, just behind me, this carving. So I don't know exactly where it was found, but clearly attached to a church, um, to the church somewhere. Um, but this, this is believed to be um, an emblem of one of the crusaders. Um, so again, it's, it's really, really difficult to tell. Um, but essentially this, this would have been um, associated um, with, with the Crusaders. Well, and this is the end to our explore. Um, so thanks for, thanks for watching and thanks for joining me. And I hope that you, um, that you enjoyed um, getting to know Sheila in a gig. And I hope that you will, um, perhaps you'll have a different view when either going to church, sort of looking at a church, you know, you don't have to be religious. Um, but just, you know, a church is not just a Christian house, place of worship. Um, it's so much more, obviously through centuries, um, it evolved in, in some very special ways and, um, and clearly had a lot of significance to people. You know, this was, a church was people's Facebook and people's Instagram. A lot of people were illiterate. I mean, most people would have been illiterate. So anything that was, um, any imagery, anything that was on a church, um, that was really, really important. That was really symbolic. So anything that they learned, anything that they saw, that would have been on a church. So, you know, <laughs> if you spend a lot of time watching, I don't know, Netflix or, or, or TV, um, then this was their Netflix. This was their only form of um, sort of wonder and, and entertainment, but also, you know, fear. Um, so yeah, I, I really do enjoy 
exploring churches and, and seeing what they can uncover. But anyway, do subscribe if you want to hear more. Um, there's going to be some exciting adventures um, closer and further afield. Um, so yeah, do join me and um, stay well. Um, do, do keep warm in winter. You're probably going to be watching this video <laughs> a long, long time after um, the snow has melted. Um, and I will um, catch up with you soon. Bye for now. Bye.